Okay. Hey, well, we're very pleased and honored to have a return visit by Dr. Robert M. Price. He's a fellow of the Jesus Seminar, a member of the Jesus Project, and author of numerous books, six of which we have for sale over there, and we will book signing later. Uh, he also has a radio show called The Bible Geek, which you can link to on our website, and maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that. Today's presentation is on pagan parallels to the Christ story. So please welcome Dr. Robert M. Christ. Yeah, thanks so much. I sure appreciate it. Yeah, let's see, I suppose that the moment we begin to become uh, critical readers of the Bible is that one in which we're no longer satisfied with being told what the text means and we decide we will see for ourselves. Uh, soon we discover that there really is no alternative to that. We may listen to and uh, consider many opinions, the more the better in fact, but ultimately it's up to us. We have to give the text our own careful scrutiny to see what we think it means. I mean, you know, you'll never know for sure, but probably get closer that way than just accepting what somebody else says. Now, uh, in, in likewise, you, you find that you will often read generalizations about what other ancient texts say, and at first you're willing to assume that the experts are assessing the evidence correctly, but as soon as you become aware that there are scholarly debates on all these things too, for instance, whether ancient Gnostics really believed in a divine redeemer, which some dispute, whether dying and rising saviors were a dime a dozen in antiquity, which some desperately deny, uh, or whether, um, well, more and more the same, you begin to realize you have to scrutinize all those questions and all those ancient texts for yourselves too. You just can't hold serious scholarly opinions at second hand. I think Billy Graham and others used to say, you know, God has no grandchildren. And you know, you can't just inherit, well, you can't inherit critical uh, opinions either, or you shouldn't. And uh, now I find I've uh, assured readers more than once that the various miracle stories of the Gospels are cut from the same cloth as uh, many others from the same environment, but I don't want anybody to take my word for it, that there are such stories or that they're relevant or similar, which is why I spend more space in my books than a lot of people do, actually including sometimes long and tedious texts. You just really have to look at them. Don't trust me. Well, uh, my approach is let's put the cards on the table. And so what I'd like to do is uh, for the rest of the time mainly is to just be a channeler for uh, certain ancient writers to uh, let them speak for themselves, hallelujah, uh, on uh, certain stories and uh, topics that we're familiar with from the Bible and the Gospels, but not so familiar with from the immediate environment. And um, uh, let me just start in with some relating to the nativity of Jesus and other great people from antiquity. I have even more of this in, I believe it's um, the, uh, the Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, a uh, Buddhist parallel and some stuff from uh, Josephus' Nativity of Moses and that of the Biblical Antiquities of Pseudo-Philo. But here's uh, some other ones less uh, common even than those. Uh, now, Jesus' birth, as you know, is announced by a heavenly visitant in Luke 1.30 and following. Well, so is Apollonius of Tyanus, as a figure that supposedly lived around the same time as Jesus and Paul. Uh, in uh, Philostratus' uh, long uh, book, The Life of Apollonius of Tyana, it says, To his mother, just before he was born, there came an apparition of Proteus, she was in no way frightened, but asked him what sort of child she would bear. He answered, Myself. And who are you? She asked. Proteus, answered he, the god of Egypt. Similarly, Olympias, who was to be the mother of Alexander the Great, had a vision. And this is from the Alexander Romance. And she saw the god Ammon embracing her that night, and as he arose from her, saying to her, uh, woman, you have a male child in your womb to be your avenger. And then an oracle told Philip of Macedon, her husband, uh, not to sleep with her until the child had been born, would rule the world. 
Now, of the Annunciation of Pythagoras, the pre-Socratic sage, Iamblichus, one of his biographers, relates that the Pythian oracle had predicted to Mnesarchus that his wife was now pregnant and would bring forth a son surpassing in beauty and wisdom all that ever lived and who would be of the greatest advantage to the human race in everything pertaining to the life of man. So, life of Pythagoras. Now, uh, what about the birth of the baby? Let me just zero in on uh, one uh, little bit. Again, there are other things. The persecution of the infant by tyrants, which you find in stories of uh, Cyrus the Great, Romulus and Remus, Krishna, Zoroaster, Moses and others. Uh, I'm just kind of skip those since they're better known, and again, I have some of those in the book. Uh, how about the, the, the neglected fact of the, the Savior being born out or laid out on the open ground? The, the phrase uh, laid in a manger in Luke actually could as easily be translated laid out on the open ground, which is the way I put it in the pre-Nicene New Testament, and that's the way you find it in um, the uh, pastoral novel Daphnis and Chloe. Uh, let's see, um, a goat herd named Laman, who grazed his flocks on this estate, found a child being suckled by one of his she-goats. There was a copse of oaks with brambles and wandering ivy and soft grass on which the child was lying. Naturally, he was amazed. He went up close and found a baby boy, big and beautiful and dressed in baby clothes finer than you would expect to find on a child that had been exposed. He had a purple cloak with a gold clasp and a dagger with an ivory handle. Turns out he's a king incognito, and that's uh, some you know clue as to whatever his true identity is. So this kind of has the uh, the uh, element of the visit of the shepherds, as well as the uh, the uh, laying of the child in the open. Uh, let's see. Um, it, Jesus, of course, turns out to be a wunderkind, a child prodigy who uh, they find in the temple. They're looking for Jesus for days in the Jerusalem video arcades and stuff, and you know, they can't find him. And finally they say, well, the last place I remember seeing him was the temple. So they go back there, and uh, uh, there's Jesus engaged in dialectic with uh, the scribes and the priests. And uh, it's a hilarious, a hilarious scene. Uh, intentionally, Luke is uh, a great uh, humorous writer writer. Anyway, similar stories are told about uh, Apollonius and others. On reaching the age when children are taught their letters, Apollonius showed great strength of memory and power of application, and much similar wisdom he delivered himself of in this temple while he was still a youth. On the death of his father, likewise, though Pythagoras was still but a youth, his aspect was most venerable and his habits most temperate, so that he was even reverenced and honored by elderly men and converted the attention of all who saw and heard him speak on himself and appeared to be an admirable person to everyone who beheld him. Hence it was reasonably asserted by many that he was the son of a god. Um, elsewhere in one of the lives of Pythagoras, it says he was known to or thought to have been the son of Apollo in particular. Um, about Alexander, having followed the entire curriculum, even astronomy, and being released from his studies, Alexander began in turn to teach his classmates. He drilled them for war and standing apart set them fighting, and when he saw one side being defeated by the other, he would go over to the losing side and help them out, and it would start winning again. This then was Alexander's upbringing. I'll uh, skip to uh, adulthood. Uh, there's a um, there's a whole rash of stories that are similar to certain miracle stories in the Gospels. You know, there are some where uh, Jesus raises or appears to raise someone from the dead. And I want you to keep in mind what is more likely the intent of the author uh, in those stories. I'm not going to take the time to read all of them, but just to remind you what they are, there's one in Luke 7, 11 through 17, where Jesus stops a funeral procession at Nain, and uh, the, the one about to be buried is the son of a widow there and her only support. And uh, he tells 
tells him to stop and he raises the son from the dead and it seems to be based actually on an Elijah story from the Old Testament but there are similar stories elsewhere for instance in Mark uh, 8 41 through 42 and again in verses 49 through 56 Jairus, a synagogue official, approaches Jesus and asks him to come heal his little daughter who is, uh, who is close to death. And by the time he gets there, they say, oh, don't bother him anymore, she's gone. But he says the child is not dead, but only sleeps and raises her up. That's interesting. The, the name Jairus means um, uh, he shall arise, which indicates that several gospel names do, that they're really allegorical, uh, ideal stories. Uh, there's yet another one in Acts 9, 36-42, where Peter uh, raises a woman disciple from the dead, a woman named Tabitha. It says that that was the name in Hebrew, means gazelle, but in Greek it was Dorcas, uh, which, you know, I, I wonder if she maybe killed herself because she couldn't stand that name anymore. But anyway, uh, Peter, <laughs> she's, on the, she's laid out on the bed. They're going to bury her soon, but Peter uh, raises her from the dead. And of course, there's the famous one in John 11 where Lazarus is raised from the dead, and at least they assume He's good and dead, right? Because Jesus says uh, uh, to take the stone away and say, Lord, uh, by this time he stinketh, as the King James says. It's four days. Of course, they assume he's been dead. We don't really hear whether he stinks or not. Uh, but So there are four of these, very similar in the Gospels and Acts, but there are loads more of them in uh, Hellenistic works. And as we sometimes hear in commentaries at this point, but they don't really give you the details, here some of them are. Here's one from the life of Apple Apollonius of Tyana, again Philostratus' work. Here too is a miracle which Apollonius worked. A girl had died just in the hour of her marriage, and the bridegroom was following her bier, lamenting, as was natural, his marriage left unfulfilled. And the whole of Rome was mourning with him, for the maiden belonged to a consular family. <clears throat> Apollonius then, witnessing their grief, said, Put down the beer, for I will stay the tears that you are shedding for this maiden. And with that he asked, What was her name? The crowd accordingly thought he was about to deliver such an oration as is commonly delivered as much to grace the funeral as to stir up lamentation, but he did nothing of the kind. But merely touching her and whispering in secret some spell over her, at once woke up the maiden from her seeming death. And the girl spoke out loud and returned to her father's house, just as Alcestis did when she was brought back to life by Hercules. And the relations of the maiden wanted to present him with the sum of 150,000 sesterces, but he said that he would freely present the money to the young lady by way of a dowry. Now whether he detected some spark of life in her, which those who were nursing her had not noticed, for it is said that although it was raining at the time, a vapor went up from her face, or whether life was really extinct and he restored it by the warmth of his touch is a mysterious problem which neither I myself nor those who were present could decide. Uh, here's one that's even a little wordier than that um, from Apuleius's Florida, uh, not about the state of Florida, but the collection of essays uh, that he called, you know, the flowers. Uh, this is about um, another healer. The famous Asclepiades, it was written, this one's written in the second century uh, CE or AD. The famous Asclepiades, uh, he, he's not the same as the healing god Asclepius, which some of you may know about, uh, it's just he's named after him. The famous Asclepiades, who ranks among the greatest of doctors, indeed if you accept Hippocrates as the very greatest, was the first to discover the use of wine as a remedy. It requires, however, to be administered at the proper moment, and it was in the discovery of the right moment that he showed a special skill, noting most carefully the slightest symptom of disorder or undue rapidity of the pulse. It chanced that once, when he was returning to his town from his country house, he observed an enormous funeral procession in the suburbs of the city. A huge multitude of men who had come out to perform the last honors stood around the bier, all of them plunged in deep sorrow and wearing worn and ragged apparel. He asked whom they were burying, but no one replied. 
So he went nearer to satisfy his curiosity and to see who it might be that was dead, or it may be, in the hope to make some discovery in the interests of his profession. Be this as it may, he certainly snatched the man from the jaws of death as he lay there on the verge of burial. The poor fellow's limbs were already covered with spices, his mouth filled with sweet-smelling unguent. He had been anointed and was all ready for the pyre. But Asclepiades looked upon him, uh, took careful note of certain signs, handled his body again and again, and perceived that the life was still in him, though scarcely to be detected. Straightway he cried out, He lives! Throw down your torches, take away your fire, demolish the pyre, take back the funeral feast and spread it on his board at home. While he spoke, a murmur arose. Some said that they must take the doctor's word. Others mocked at the physician's skill. At last, in spite of the opposition offered even by his relations, perhaps because they had already entered into possession of the dead man's property, uh, perhaps because they did not yet believe his words, Asclepiades persuaded them to put off the burial for a brief space. Thus, having rescued him from the hands of the undertaker, he carried the man home, as it were, from the very mouth of hell, and straightway revived the spirit within him, and by means of certain drugs called forth the life that still lay hidden in the secret places of the body. Uh, you notice in several of these the element of the uh, skepticism of the bystanders. The uh, healer uh, says, no, wait just a minute here. Uh, let's take a second look. Like, Get out of here. Just like in the stories where Jesus says that uh, he's going to raise up the daughter of Jairus, and they, they laughed him to scorn. And Jesus says, she's not dead, just asleep. And similar. And a lot of these miracle stories have that. You'll see more of it. Well, here is a little bit from a, a, a work uh, that I wish we, well, it's like a guide to a lot of ancient works that we don't have anymore. Uh, the uh, Bishop Photius summarized loads of works known to him, and we have the summary, though we don't have the works, but it's good enough in some cases to know what people were reading. And so here's a part of his summary of Iamblichus' story, a Babylonian story, one, one of several ancient novels that were very popular. They flee again from there, overtake the funeral cortege of a certain woman, and join the crowd to watch. An aged Chaldean astrologer arrives and forbids the burial, saying that the young woman is still breathing. That proves to be true. So, of course, there was much more detail in it, but, you know, that's all we need to know. that We got another parallel there. Here's one from Apuleius again, second century Latin writer, initiate of Mithras and Isis both. Uh, he's the one that wrote about Asclepiades, but this comes from his novel, The Metamorphosis, also known as The Golden Ass, um, because the, the main character is transformed into a donkey by magic and then has to uh, be transformed back by the grace of the goddess. And uh, it's filled with all sorts of interesting things about ancient Rome. Uh, in this one, there's been a scam to uh, poison to death this guy so that his relatives can get hold of his possession. And they went to this doctor to enlist him. And uh, he uh, realized he was in a strange position. If he just said, heck no, find yourself another crook, they would. And so he decided he would pretend to go along with it and uh, just give the guy enough drug to put him to sleep temporarily, then bring him out of it and catch the, the would-be murderers uh, and profiteers red-handed. So uh, at, this, at this point in the story, uh, he explains what he's done. I gave him no poison, but a soothing drink of mandragora, which is of such force that it will cause any man to sleep as though he were dead. But if it be so that the child hath received the drink as I tempered it with mine own hands, he is yet alive and doth but rest and sleep, and after his sleep he shall return to life again. The opinion of this ancient physician was found good, and every man had a desire to go to the sepulchre where the child was laid. Amongst them all, the father of the child removed with his own hands the covering of the coffin, and found his son rising up after uh, his dead and soporiferous sleep. 
And when he beheld him as one risen from the dead, he embraced him in his arms, and he could speak never a word for his present gladness, but presented him before the people with great joy and consolation. And as he was wrapped and bound in the clothes of his grave, so he brought him before the judges. And then the, the, the crooks get theirs. Here's one from the, uh, I believe this is from, yeah, the story of Apollonius of Tyre, another widely read uh, ancient Greek novel. Uh, the daughter of the king Apollonius of Tyre has been set adrift, and this is how she nearly dies and is brought back. So saying, he ordered, they find the woman's body afloat and they think she's dead. So saying, he ordered that a pyre be constructed immediately. But while the pyre was being carefully and expertly constructed and assembled, a medical student of youthful appearance but mature judgment arrived. When he saw the corpse of the girl being placed on the pyre, he looked at his teacher and said, what is the cause of this, recently unexplained, of this recent unexplained death? The teacher said, your arrival is timely. The situation requires your presence. Take a jar of unguent and pour it over the body of the girl to satisfy the last rites. The young man took a jar of unguent, went to the girl's beer, pulled aside the clothing from the upper part of the body, poured out the unguent, ran his suspicious hands over all her limbs and detected quiescent warmth in her chest cavity. The young man was astounded to realize that the girl was only apparently dead. He touched her veins to check for signs of movement and closely examined her nostrils for signs of breathing. He put his lips to her, her lips and detecting signs of life in the form of slight breathing that, as it were, was struggling against false death, he said, apply heat at four points. When he had done this, he began to massage her lightly, and the blood that had coagulated began to flow because of the anointing. When the young man saw this, he ran to his teacher and said, Doctor, the girl you think is dead is alive. To convince you, I will clear up her obstructed breathing. With some assistance, he took the girl to his bedroom, placed her on his bed, opened her clothing, warmed oil, moistened a woolen compress with it, and placed the compress on the upper part of the girl's body. Her blood, which had congealed because of severe cold, began to flow once heat was applied, and her previously obstructed breathing began to infiltrate to her innermost organs. With the cleaning up of her, clearing up of her veins, the girl opened her eyes, recovered her breath, and said in a soft, indistinct voice, Please, doctor, do not touch me in any other way than it is proper to touch the wife of a king and the daughter of a king. When the young man realized he had discovered with his skill what his teacher had failed to observe, he hurried joyfully to his doctor, as his teacher, doctor and teacher mean the same thing, of course, and said, come, teacher, and witness your student's skill. The teacher, on entering the bedroom, saw that the girl he thought was dead was alive and said to his student, I commend your medical knowledge, I praise your skill, and I admire your care, but I don't want you to be deprived of the rewards of your medical expertise. Take as your payment the money that accompanied the girl, if they found it, whether. And he gave him 10,000 gold sesterces and prescribed for the girl a nourishing diet and a regimen of fo fomentations. Uh, you notice how several of these stories have anointing for burial, a common thing, and at the end of that one, uh, there's also the notion that, uh, that uh, she is going to be fed, or she speaks, or one thing or another, so that you know, yeah, she really did come out of it, just like in some of the gospel stories. You read the thing where um, uh, the daughter of Jairus is raised from the dead, and Jesus says, give her something to eat. Why? Well, to show she's not a ghost, because they, they didn't think ghosts could eat, not having material bodies. And uh, so often these little details mean something. They're proof that the thing has happened. Uh, here's an empty tomb story. Uh, in another, maybe the greatest of all these uh, novels that are written right around the New Testament period, uh, Caritan's novel, Kyrius and Calliroe. Kyrius is falsely incited to rage against his wife Calliroe and delivers a kick which seems to kill her. She's entombed alive. They don't know that, right? So soon pirates who were uh, in all these novels at one point or another, um, they just love them, uh, have asked matey. Um, they see that, oh, here's an aristocratic tomb that's all newly sealed. There must be all kinds of you know, great 
rich stuff uh, in there. So they break in to rob it. But uh, just as they do, there is Kaliraway now uh, reviving uh, from the, the coma she was temporarily in. They say, oh, this is great. Now we've got a witness here. What are we going to do? So they kidnap her. Well, let's just take her with us and we'll sell her as a slave and increase our, uh, our profit that way. So they take her into captivity, and uh, the whole rest of the story has to do with um, Kyrius learning that she is alive and, and chasing her all over the Mediterranean to find her again. And, uh, and he uh, undergoes various trials and tribulations until they're united. And indeed, there's several stories like this. But uh, at one point, uh, after a lot has happened, Kaliraway thinks of how her husband Kyrius must be uh, doing everything he can to, to, to find her, and she, she says, you are mourning for me and repenting and sitting by an empty tomb. Uh, the phrase itself that kind of has New Testament uh, reverberations to it. Well, what happens when Kyrias goes to mourn and finds that the tomb is empty now? When he reached the tomb, he found that the stones had been moved and the entrance was opened. He was astonished at the sight and overcome by fearful perplexity at what had happened. Rumor, a swift messenger, told the Syracusans this amazing news. They all quickly crowded round the tomb, but no one dared go inside until Hermocrates gave an order to do so. The man who went in reported the whole situation accurately. It seemed incredible that even the corpse was not lying there. Then Kyrius himself determined to go in in his desire to see Kalir away again, even dead. But though he hunted through the tomb, he could find nothing. Many people could not believe it and went in after him. They were all seized by helplessness. One of those standing there said, the funeral offerings have been carried off, the shroud has been stripped off. It is tomb robbers who have done that, but what about the corpse? Where is it? Many different suggestions circulated in the crowd. Kyrius looked toward the heavens, stretched up his arms, and cried, Which of the gods is it then, who has become my rival in love and carried off Kaliraue and is now keeping her with him? So, I mean, this even continues. Right for a minute there, he thinks she's been raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. And the whole thing up to this time sounds right out of the Gospel of John. Uh, very similar to the story in John 21 through 10. Uh, let's see, uh, the story goes on. In, in Miletus, off the coast of Asia Minor, Kaliraue comes to believe falsely that her husband has perished while searching for her. Uh, and uh, she remarries to a local governor, Dionysius. Now, to console her and to try to give closure so that, uh, like in the Beatles song, Babies in Black, uh, she won't think of him anymore and will we'll just fall in love with Dionysius. Uh, he erects a tomb, of course, an empty one, for Kyrius. And uh, they just think the body is lost, but in fact, he's alive. Uh, and However, not for long, apparently, because elsewhere, not far away, Kyrius has been condemned to the cross by another local ruler. And here's the passage. Without even seeing them or hearing their defense, the master at once ordered the crucifixion of the 16 men in the hut. They were brought out chained together at foot and neck, each carrying his cross. Now, Kyria said nothing when he was let off with the others, but his friend Polycarmus, as he carried his cross, said, Clear away, it is because of you that we're suffering like this. You are the cause of all our troubles. But at the last minute, um, th and they get crucified, but at the last minute, the word arrives that Kyrius' sentence is commuted. He can go. Mithridates sent everybody off to reach Kyrius before he died. They found the, re okay, they found the rest nailed up on their crosses. Kyrius was just ascending his. So the executioner checked his gesture, and Kyrius climbed down from his cross. Later, he recalls the situation. Mithridates had once ordered that I'd be taken down from the cross. I was practically finished by then. Uh, this is one of uh, several stories in which this, uh, this happens. Another one uh, was very 
popular novel, The Ephesian Tale, written by Xenophon. Uh, in it, uh, just the same thing, just changed the names practically. The beautiful Anthea appears to have died from a dose of poison, but in fact she had only been placed in a death-like coma. She's entombed and she awakens in the tomb. And there's a quoted passage, Meanwhile, some pirates had found that a girl had been given a sumptuous burial and that a great store of woman's finery was buried with her and a great hoard of gold and silver. After nightfall, they came to the tomb, burst open the doors, came in and took away the finery and saw that Anthea was still alive. They thought that, that this too would turn out very profitable for them, so they raised her up and wanted to take her. Well, they do take her. And then her, um, her fiancé, Habrocomes, comes in search of her, finds out the tomb is empty, goes off after her, and uh, after many, many misadventures, he gets condemned to the cross. Quote, they set up the cross and attached him to it, tying his hands and feet tight with ropes. That is the way the Egyptians crucify. Then they went away and left him hanging there, thinking that the victim was securely in place. But then uh, Habrakomis prays to the gods to spare him this, this undeserved death, and they hear his prayers because it says, quote, A sudden gust of wind arose and struck the cross, sweeping away the subsoil on the cliff where it had been fixed. Habrakomis fell into the torrent and was swept away. The water did him no harm. His fetters did not get in his way. Well, he frees himself, and after yet more adventures, he and he's convinced as now his wife, his fiance, is dead. He comes to a temple uh, where, in happier days, he and Anthea had uh, built images of themselves as an offering to the love goddess Aphrodite. Uh, and uh, he thinks she's dead. He's mourning for. He's weeping. And a couple of his old friends, Lucan and Rhoda, who haven't seen him for a long time, see this guy. Quote: They did not recognize him, but wondered who would stay beside someone else his offerings. And so Lucan spoke to him, why are you sitting weeping, young man? Habrakomis replied, I am the unfortunate Habrakomis. When Lucan and Rhoda heard this, they were immediately dumbfounded, but gradually recovered and recognized him by his appearance and voice from what he said and from his mention of Anthea. So there's the why do you weep element you see in the gospel accounts and so on. In, uh, well, there's a couple of other ones from Achilles Tatius' novel, Leucippa and Clitophon, but I guess I don't really have time to go into all of those. But you notice there's this pattern.